as I was writing it, this whole red pill movement came, became more, I became more aware of it. And like, it's like more like the non-Muslims movement in terms of how men should act. And you know, there's plenty of good stuff in that, but I also saw a lot of problems in that and Muslims lapping it up. So I was like, okay, interesting. Now we've got these two extremes. We've got the feminism, we've got the red pill. Now I guess I slot somewhere in the middle, you know? So, um, yeah, that's the idea. Okay. How long ago was this realization of, um, you know, when you were on Muslim Twitter and you had this idea about writing the book, um, or that realization that I need to learn about this. And then how long mm. ago did you finish the book? So the whole Twitter thing must have, I must have closed my Twitter account. I want to say 2017. Mm. And it was in my time on Twitter where those, those feelings surfaced, um, those arguments happened, mm. but I didn't do much about it. But it was probably in 2019 when I realized, hmm, maybe I could like do a book and I could like kind of specialize and focus on this topic. Mm. 2019. Then I probably started it properly in 2020. And then it was probably done like 18 months after that or something. Mm, not sure, yeah. so, in so about, I think, it, I, I think like I, I first printed it like six months ago, nine months ago, something like that. And I think your marketing knowledge and expertise helped with like the website and the marketing element and the crowdfunding. So you can see how those beneficial skills start stacking um isn't it so absolutely moving um more into the book it's funny when you mentioned um with a slight smile if i'm correct in perceiving when you said you interacted with like the uk muslims and you found how they are because i immediately went to them three archetypes that you've got in the book <laughs> that kind of made me laugh <laughs> a little bit um imad the uh, alpha and uh, <laughs> Or murder under the thumb or, thumb or something like that and um yeah so talk it rings true because we all i feel like we see that archetype um in society around us and people that brought yeah. you into those um you, you mentioned red pill what are the what would you say are the points that we can agree with and this might be a bit of a difficult question but um the points that we can agree with and the points that as muslims we can't agree with yeah that's a big topic you're right not um, okay, uh, i did like not let's yeah. say not the, um as many points just some key points let's say or, or one key point yeah i don't want to uh it's hard to be general with red pill because i i'm aware that there are different offshoots on of it and so i don't want to like say oh this is one point that they they make but it's only one portion of the group but I'll try my best. I, I did a podcast on this, on the Mind Heist podcast, Yanni, and I think that was quite like thorough and good. But okay, so what can we agree with them? Um, we can agree that men are different to women. Men have different roles than women. Um, we can also agree that women think differently to men and uh, the way you communicate with women should be different. And you need to... Um, change your approach when you're talking to a woman when you're dealing with a woman when you're trying to whatever convince a woman of something is different when you're dealing with a man um they of course they apply that more to to like how to pick up women and stuff like that a lot of the time but you know the same basic principle would apply with your wife with a potential spouse with your sister with the, someone you're volunteering in the same group as or whatever um in terms of yeah men and women are different they think differently um they have this whole concept of, you know, the, what's it, sexual market value and all that. Mm. I think there, that's probably an area we would disagree strongly with them on, which is like, there's this, there's a, there's a market out there for like mating or marriage or dating or whatever they talk about. And it's like, with Muslims, it kind of doesn't always apply. It partially applies, but it doesn't always apply. So they are obsessed with, you know, it, it's like very fits perfectly, almost too perfectly into this very hedonistic, materialistic worldview, um, or almost atheistic worldview, where it's like the purpose of life for a man is to accumulate the most wealth, the most women, um, and the most like status as possible. Status amongst people, of course. And, you know, if that's the starting point for them, for how they think about um, dating or marriage or relationships, then... I think, you know, you can see how we're going to go 
we're going to depart from the way they think very quickly because, okay, so for us, um, women, I mean, women is, women is like a significant part of life for a man, right? Um, some, a lot of men, they, they just can't get on with life until they just sorted that part of their life out. You know, they got married and stuff. So that's fair enough. But we don't make our goal women or to accumulate the most women that we've even married, never mind like dated and all that, right? Um, for us, like like Allah says, it's like a woman, a wife, you know, it could be a, a, a mata'a, like it's a, it's a useful thing in the dunya, it's something good in the dunya, something even to enjoy in the dunya, but it also could be a distraction. So, you know, we don't make it our number one goal in life, but it, it could be a great thing uh, uh, to have a family, to have kids, to be the leader of, of that group of, of people. Um, but we, we just don't make it like the main thing. And really we, we, Yanni, what are we really going around looking at our friends or other people and be like, yeah, that guy's, that guy's sick. He's got four wives versus one wife. Like, re does it really make you like better? Like objectively? No, uh, we can't really say that. Then we get onto money. So this is a, probably the number one thing after women that they focus on. And again, we know uh, money risk is qadr from Allah that Allah gives you. And you could implement the best strategies and you'll still make whatever Allah wrote for you. Um, although you do have to strive because that's what's expected of you. You have to implement, you have to work the best way that you know to work. Okay, re if I want to make, for a good reason, I want to make 50K a month, I need to reasonably do the work that would get me that, okay? But then whether that happens or not, that's in the, in the hands of Allah. So with money, we can't associate um, your value in the eyes of Allah or in the eyes of people really with uh, having a lot of money because you know you could tr do everything it takes and still not get money um we just we need money to live we need money to achieve some good things so we just do whatever's reasonable but it doesn't define your value right because especially the number one reason is the prophet sallam was not a wealthy person yeah the prophet sallam he rejected having lots of wealth yeah, he had the chance to have it, he didn't. And we have uh, companions who were very wealthy and those were not wealthy and they both have the highest status. So that, that tells you very clearly that in a Muslim's worldview, being rich is not like something that would elevate your status per se. What will elevate your status is if Allah gives you money, how you spend it. And if Allah doesn't give you money, how you react to that, right? And also how you spend the little money you do have, right? So that's like the money element. It's not the number one goal for us. It can be helpful, but it's not like the num number one goal. The third element, <coughs> um, what did I say? Uh, oh, status. Status, again, what the, the, you know, the red pill movement, they focus on status amongst other men and amongst women. You know, you've got to be that man that every woman wants and every woman is attracted to. And she's just like begging for you to like give her some attention. And amongst men, you've got to be that guy, you know, you've got that, um, you know, that body, you've got that car, you've got that watch. And uh, therefore, they're going to respect you and look up to you and all of that. And, you know, um, status amongst people is we know it's not important versus status with Allah. Right. That's what we focus on as Muslims. And so, you know, even I was just looking at hadith the other day. And as that hadith of the two wolves, I don't want to misquote it, but it's basically there is nothing, uh, 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 two wolves on uh, uh, like attacking a herd of sheep is more dangerous for a man's deen than uh, wealth and a, a passion for wealth and, and status and high status. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but seeking status and fame is a big, big problem. It's a big, big problem. Um, and so how can we seek status in the way that these guys kind of promote? And so with all of these three things, there's some element, there's some truth to it in terms of how we would apply it. <coughs> Sorry, but the way that they chase it as their number one, like these three things I mentioned, I think is a good summary of like, their whole thing is improve yourself to get the most of these three things. Mm. Now, what do I say? I'm like, I don't even want those three things as a biggest, highest goal, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, that's beautifully explained. Just a couple of things come to mind about how, obviously, we have the ayah, inna akramakum indallahi atfaqum, like, the most honored amongst you is the one with the most taqwa. And yeah. what comes to mind is, essentially, a Muslim should be playing a different game. So they're not even chasing the mm -hmm. same things. I think they have, like, looks, money, and status. But it's all within, like, the Western liberal secular paradigm. Like, it works to a degree within that and i think where the issue 
for Muslims is because they've adopted this system, right? And they're living in this system. They see the parallels because even, um, I kind of agree with Daniel Hakika you on this, where he says like, if you have the base level of understanding where you can decipher the right from the bad, um, then you can take elements from it. But if you don't even have the base and your Akida and stuff is going to get affected, then obviously you need to um, tackle that first. But in terms of like uh, hypergamy, they talk about a lot. And that's this thing mm. about how um, females or women, they generally marry upwards or on the same level as them. And then mm -hmm. there's also, but what you mentioned about how it doesn't apply to Muslims, I think um, I might be wrong on this, but I think it's called homogamy, where it's like people generally like to marry within the same social or cultural group because it's like you, yeah. you could get someone who's high in, let's use those terms, looks money and status, but they're not Muslim. They're not going to succeed mm. in like the Muslim marriage market <laughs> compared to just a Muslim with a lesser. So there's another Absolutely. element where the problems arise, like I was mentioning, where you know how you have like these apps now where they try to use the same thing as uh, these non-Muslim apps where it's like swiping and it's a completely different psychology that now studies are coming out on on how it skews like the um, it skews the potential for people and how obviously people are assessing just based on looks primarily and then that causes an issue and say if a Muslim a young Muslim is on these apps like um, let's say Muzmatch or something where it's that same system of like swiping and stuff then they that's where they see parallels because that's when they see the link that look if someone is um showing off like more looks money status they seem on the surface to get that lower level of success more than someone who's like um yeah. there with like just be in his hand kind of thing right so i think that's where the um difficulty arises